plan, but um, yep. So, um, with the exception of again the pastors that are in the room, if we could uh, just take a minute, listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, and we can wait until one man prays briefly for the first part of our retreat. So whoever that is, listen to what the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. And even, you don't have to stand up, just short prayer. Father. Oh, Father God, you're worthy, Father God. You're worthy of all the praise, Lord God. Oh, God, there is no one like you, Father. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Oh, God, we praise you this morning, Lord God. You are still a will in the middle of a will. You are still a rock which we stand upon. You are still God Almighty. Oh, God, we thank you this morning, Lord God. We thank you, Father, for raising us up this morning, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your guidance, Lord God. We give you glory, Lord God. We give you honor, Lord God. We just praise you, Lord God. Oh, Lord, we love you, Lord, because you first loved us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for the strength, Lord God, that comes from your arms, Lord God, that dwells in our bodies, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, for the light, Lord God, that comes from you, Lord God, that we see by. Oh, God, we thank, you, God. thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Lord. And so that's how the morning, the rest of the day is going to work. Each one of us will have an opportunity, right, to, to share and to express a little bit about what we're hearing from the Lord as we spend our time together. And so I'm, I'm really hoping that today we get uh, a chance to know God a little bit better, deepen our relationship with him, moving from, you know, just knowing about God um, to really experiencing himself as a divine subject, and we are his divine objects, right? So we need to move a little bit today from our heads to our hearts, uh, kind of getting a little bit deeply rooted as men who firmly believe in who we are in God and how we should be living as sons of the Most High God as men of God. And um, so as I was thinking about today, I, I think I'd like you to be thinking about at least four uh, takeaways from the day. Uh, the first, as men of God, we should be able to m more clearly and effectively fulfill our originally designed God-given masculine roles, All right? We need to model God his character, his ways, and lean into his transforming grace in order to be able to do that. Secondly, I think we should be able to more confidently face and move through and then come out of the challenges that we have in our lives, the circumstances that we're living in, all right? Next, I think we should be able to better know and live in the promises and the plans and the purposes that God has for our lives as men. And then I think hopefully we can take another step to being the salt and the light into this world such as it is. And there's a lot going on in this world. But we need to bring the kingdom and spread the news. Right? So um, as I mentioned, today we're going to try to focus on the Trinity, seeing God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and understanding us as men in relationship to those uh, three aspects of God. So um, at the outset, let me say that certainly the Trinity is a, a mystery, right? And um, I'm going to join uh, John Wesley when he said, bring me a worm 
that can comprehend them. And I'll show you a man that can comprehend God. Yeah, and so that's where we are, right? Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, that's Wesley, all right? It's not Tony. Uh, it's not, uh, he, he, said, he said, bring me a worm that can comprehend a man, and I'll bring you a man that can comprehend God. Yeah, so, but that's our challenge, right? I mean, to know him um, as best we can. Um, but with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we're not, we're not um, defenseless in that, right? Right? And so we're really counting on him to kind of give us that fuller and deeper revelation and knowledge and experience of who and how he is. And interestingly enough, the word Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Bible. It's not in Scripture. No. But the truth of the Godhead is to be found in the Scriptures, in all his creation, and through revelation from God himself. And what do we know? Well, we know that there is one true God. And he is omnipotent. So, omnipotence, all power resides in him. He sets the limit of the waves to the shore. He has power to heal. He has power to raise from the dead. And we know that he is omniscient. And he knows all things. He knows when we sit and when we stand. He knows what you're thinking before you speak it. He knows the length of your days. He's put them in the book already. And he's omnipresent. Well, figure that one. He is at one time in all things, everywhere, at once, holding everything together. Go figure that. Man, I mean, really, right? Omnipresent. He's eternal. Before things were created, he was already the great I am. And after they cease to be, he will always be and forever. And he's unchanging, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In his love and in his faithfulness to his creation and to you and to me. Glory. So, try unity. Three persons, three personalities, three roles, three purposes. Each sharing equally the qualities and the attributes of omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, all in one eternal, never changing. Picture, if you will, the Trinity as a human body of many parts. The Father is the head and the heart. As the head, the Father has a plan and purpose that he's working out for his creation and for you and for me. Ephesians 1.11 tells us that God made us his heritage or portion to obtain an inheritance in accordance with his purpose who works everything in agreement with the counsel and the design of his own will and plan. That's what's in God's head. And as the heart of the Godhead, it is the Father's love that resides there and that led him to send his Son to be our Savior. And that's John 3.16, just in a nutshell. In this illustration of a body, Jesus is the arms and the hands. These are the arms that reached out into a broken and lost world. These are the arms that expressed his longing to bring all men back to the Father. These were the hands that touched and healed and comforted. These are the hands that took the nails to hang him on the cross for the atonement of our sins. And finally, in this illustration, the Holy Spirit serves as the legs and the feet. It's the Holy Spirit who walks with us 
on our journey of faith. And the Father sends forth the Son. The second person is also the Father's Word, His Christ, the Word made flesh. Mm. Jesus, the Son, is the sent one to carry out the Father's plan through selfless, selfless love and to restore by faithful obedience every one of us, every man, back to the Father. And the Son sends the Spirit, the third person, Amen. and instructs and gives revelation to the Word and walks with and transforms each man back into the original image of man, restored to a right relationship with the Father through the Son. So that's the goal. God is constantly, constantly communicating about himself to us, his men. Think about that. That this trinity, this, this omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent spirit is constantly trying to communicate who he is about himself to you and me. And what's he communicating? His intentions for us, his desires for us, his promises and plans for us. Each person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is still revealing who God is, what are his ways, where he can be found, how we can come home to him. And this is the activity of a God, a good, good Father that's directed to each man here in this sanctuary this morning and every morning that we live and breathe. So in this portrayal of the Trinity, we can see the dynamic central role of the Word of God and all that is contained within that Word. The Word breathed and spoken the word penned and written, the word believed and lived. So the very, the word then is, you know, the very word that is breathed into the spirit by the Father. The word is God's written word on our hearts by Jesus. The word of God is given to us as a blueprint with instructions by the Holy Spirit on how to live a redeemed life. So this active, creative, ongoing work of the triune God is principally and has always been about creating man in his own image. So a word or two about that. See if we can appreciate a little bit fuller what's going on still in creation with us, right? We're still being created. In Genesis 126 to 27, this is the amplified version, we hear the word that God spoke, and he spoke his word with the finished creation that was his most personal and crowning touch, and that's you and me. He says this, he says, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image, after our likeness, and let him have complete authority and dominion over every created thing. So God created man in his image, in the image and likeness of God, he created them male and female. And God blessed them. Now, up until this point in the creation story, whatever God created, from his point of view, was good. But in verse 31, yeah, we get to the uh uh-oh. In verse 31, well, everything that he made now includes man in his image. Well, he didn't get the women yet. Okay, he's still working on us. Okay, he's still working on man. 
And he declares it not just good, but very good. And it's worthy of his complete approval. The creation of man by God the Father is such a monumental moment, even for God, that is brought forward in Genesis a second time to show its full measure of worthiness in the creation narrative. In Genesis 2, 7, we are given this amazing detail. It says, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Really? Really? So the image and likeness of the created is now animated with the very life and spirit of the creator. The breath of God in which lives his very word is now imparted and breathed into us, into all men. That's a wow. Yeah. So this is a narrative about the creation of all mankind, but also about every single individual man who is here this morning. Each of us imprinted with the word of God. Each of us brought to life and sustained by the breath of God. Each of us uniquely created in the image of God. Let's never forget that. So let's talk a minute about the meaning of the word image. Other terms for it might be a resemblance or a representation or an impression of some other physical thing or object. Picture like a mirror reflecting an image of an object. An image can also be a poetic description that takes us somewhere deeper beyond the understood meaning. But you know, an image, it, the word image can also be a verb, to image something, right? To present a copy, of, to emulate or act like, right? We can image, we can present, we can image God our Father. Think about how we do that, how you do that, how you are about imaging God. So then having and being the image and likeness of God means in the simplest terms that we were made to resemble him to give representation of who and how he is, especially since we can't see him and we can only know about him just so much. John 4, 24 tells us that God is not a physical being, but that God is spirit. So the image of God refers to the immaterial part of humanity, a likeness unto God mentally, socially, morally, that was imparted to Adam and then to you and me. So mentally, Adam and all humanity was created man, a rational, thinking, volitional agent. In other words, as human beings, we can possess knowledge, we can exercise reason, and we can choose. But this is a reflection of God's intellect and his freedom. Morally, Adam and mankind was created in righteousness and perfect innocence. This is a reflection of God's holiness and his goodness. And our conscious and our, our moral compass, that inclination that's inside of us to still choose right and wrong, is a vestige of our original state. And socially, Adam and humanity was created for fellowship, for belonging. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. That's right. And so that reflects the love of God who always intended to be 
in a relationship, in communion with him. Yeah. He wants us to belong to him. So each of us was created to be a conscious mirror of God's image, to reflect his glory, to image forth his power and his wisdom and love into the world. The glory of a mirror is to put its face to the light and to let the light shine. This is what mirrors are made for, to reflect the light that's before it. Originally, that light was to be the light of the triune God. The light of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This was the light Adam and mankind and you and me were created to reflect. But, but, but then sin entered the world. Now we can't blame it on the woman. That's too easy, okay? And, and too familiar. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, uh, you know, as men, I mean, come on. We could say no. The buck stops here. Exactly right. But then, you know, sin entered the world. And the first manifestation was that Adam and Eve were discontent with being mirrors. Yeah, they began to want to be their own source of light. Yeah? That's right. Rather than wanting to be mirrors that reflected God's face, they wanted to take his place. Right. Not good. They suddenly became conscious of the fact that good mirrors have to turn whichever way the light moves. You can't be your own master. And so they used their freedom to choose to be their own source of light. And they chose to turn their mirror face away from God. And then all they could do was block the light and cast a shadow across the world that they were once to have dominion over. But let's be clear about something. The longing of Adam and Eve to be the light is a distortion of the legitimate longing to reflect the light. And you still have that legitimate longing. Otherwise, it'd be home in bed. <coughs> but the scriptures teach that everyone since the fall is born with some distorted longing. Man's fall into sin didn't destroy or remove the image of God but it did disfigure it. Adam and Eve's longing to be the light instead of the mirror to reflect it marred the image of God within themselves and passed that, that damaged likeness onto all the descendants. It's Romans 5.12. Today we still bear the image of God, but we also bear those scars of sin mentally, morally, socially. Since man has sinned, he certainly is not as fully in the likeness of God as he was before the fall. As men, our moral purity has been lost and compromised. Our sinful character does not reflect God's holiness like it was intended. As mere men, our intellect is corrupted by falsehoods and misunderstanding. Our speech no longer continually glorifies God. Ouch. As mere men, our relationships are often governed by selfishness and self-interest rather than love. You know better than I where are the distortions in your own longings in your own thoughts and in your behaviors are. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. Ah, go ahead. And the pride of life. Yep. It's true. But, 
But even in this distorted and broken form, it still is the imprinted, God-breathed image of God himself that makes man, you and me, redeemable and worth redeeming in the sight of God. God still sees the image of himself in you and in me. He still has faith in his word, spoken in the beginning that it is very good. You and I are still very good. Praise God. We're still very good. In that regard, every intention of the Father's heart that he had in the original design and plan for you and me is still yes and amen. And the good news is that his Father's heart, full of a love that first loved us, is still full, even while we were yet broken and distorted. It's from the Father's heart that his love propelled him to send his Son, the Christ, Jesus, to restore us back to our original image. Through Christ, Corinthian tells us, we are made new creations, back into the likeness of God, able now to see for ourselves what God sees in us. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, to be the mirrors enabled to reflect once again the light of our Creator, to reflect the light emanating from the heart of the Father. And so we've arrived perhaps at, as men, our highest calling to reflect the heart of the Father. That's your highest calling. You'll show it, you'll experience, you'll express it in your own way. But each one of us here has a high calling. You can express it however you want, but look to the heart of the Father. That's what we're to reflect. To be mirrors of Abba, our Father. It's in Romans 8.15 that we see this expression, Abba, used for the first time as we are reminded that we've received the spirit of adoption which produces a sonship of us as children of the God who created us. It's within the roles of father and son that God wants to have a warm, affectionate, personal relationship with him. As men, we are part of his family and he wants us to recognize his gentle concern and his desire to bless and protect us. He wants us to sit at the head of the family table with him and to be ready to easily use the expression, Papa, Daddy, Abba. And that it would be welcome here, easy for us to say. In this regard, our heavenly fathers, our, our earthly fathers, their men can give us a picture of what God the Father is truly like. As mirror images of the heavenly father's heart, our earthly dads want to spend time with their children. They want to be with them. They want to care for them. They want to love them. They want their children to know how much they would risk to protect them. Dads want their children to know what they would do if they lost them. And when life happens, challenging circumstances, fears, failures, dads are there to pick us up, dust us off, come alongside us, and walk us through to the other side. That's what dads are for. So for a child of God, it should be pretty great that our Heavenly Father, our Abba Father, is like Dad. Right? Well, maybe not. 
right? For the fatherless and for those of us with absent dads, dads who might have been physically or emotionally absent or just distant, incapable in some way, this isn't such good news. And that's not been much of our experience with fatherhood. And let's face it, we've all had imperfect dads, imperfect mirrors themselves, reflecting what they knew and what they experienced back to us. And so perhaps we're frightened by God the Father because we're scared and terrified of our earthly father. How could we come to God with, without fear when we were afraid to go home, when dad's there? How could we understand God's love and faithfulness when dad left town because he loved someone or somebody else or something else more than he loved us? How can God be a mighty fortress of protection when dad hit instead of hugged? How can God be a firm foundation of trust and assurance when dad built in us so much insecurity and disappointment? It's a fight. It's a fight to not assume that God enjoys disciplining me more than blessing me. It might be a fight not to think that God is mad at me more often than he delights in me. Perhaps in the end, it's a fight to think that God thinks differently of me than my dad did. And I think that's the condition of many of us here this morning in the room. But 2 Corinthians 2.11, Amplified, reminds us that Satan is always trying to get the advantage over us and that we should not be ignorant of his wiles and his intentions. So it's just like him to invade our thought and emotional life and have us hold up flawed, imperfect people, our earthly dads, as models for a perfect and holy, heavenly Father. Just like him to have us use our experiences of an imperfect earthly dad and how he is or was and have that shape how we know and understand and appreciate our heavenly Father. But 2 Corinthians 10 provides the antidote for his wiles. To paraphrase from the TPT, the, the Passion Translation, he says, if you freely forgive anyone for anything before the face of Christ, you would not be exploited by the adversary, for you would know his clever schemes. So there's a scheme to keep us from seeing ourselves as Father God sees us and from mirroring a truer image of who we are as men, sons of the Father. And so forgiveness is the first of two keys. And the Lord has placed on my heart a simple exercise, a simple practice this morning that I'm going to hope that you have some courage and some freedom to do. Now, this will be very private. But in the center of your table, there's a red cup with post-it notes. I'd like you to take two post-it notes, one each different color. Two post-it notes, one, one color and one the other color. All right, two post-it notes. One, one color, one the other color. All right? And if anybody needs help with colors, well, if somebody at the table will help you out. All right? Keep, keep an eye on Bernie. Keep an eye. Just keep. 
All right. So you should have two post-it notes in front of you. One one color, one the other color. All right. So the point of this exercise is hopefully going to just take us a little step further into being free to see God as he truly is and not see him through the eyes and experiences of anybody else. So I want you to take a minute, and I want you to think of your dad. I want you to think of your father. I want you to think of your relationship with him, your experiences with your father. Take your time. And find that honest, maybe brutally honest place in your memory, in your heart, for a characteristic or a trait of your dad that was kind of hard, harsh, hurtful. It expressed some deficit that he might have had, some shortcoming that was your dad, something that was not representative of how we see God the Father. And I want you to identify that with one word or a phrase. And on one of the post-it notes, I want you to begin this way. Dad, I forgive you for, and then fill in the blank. Dad, I forgive you for. And fill in the blank. And you're not going to share this. It's just for you. And after you identify that, I want you to pray over it. I want you to ask God to help you forgive your father for that particular trait, that particular hurt. And you're going to pray over it. You're going to give it to God. You're going to lay it at the cross. And you're going to let go of it. So take a minute, just you and God, and what you're asking him to help you forgive. Thank you, Lord. Dad, I forgive you. With the help of God and of my heart, I've held on to this for a while. And now to come to think of it, I forgive you. I forgive you. Great. And then what I'd like you to do is take it, and I want you to crumple it up. Crumple it up. Crumple it real good, tight, so that it's like it's like trapped in there. Crumple it. No, we're not going to throw it at anybody. Okay, that's as Kevin would do it, but we're not doing it that way. <laughs> nope. I want you to crumple it up, and I want you to, if you still have any Post-it notes in the red cup, take the Post-it notes out of the red cup and put that crumpled piece of paper in the red cup. Right? Pass the cup around, get rid of it. Get rid of the resentment, any bitterness, any sadness, free, free, right? 
which leaves you now with one post-it note. Okay? That's the post-it note that actually might be the harder one to think through. But that's the note where you're going to be thankful for some attribute, some quality, some characteristic, something from your father. Great. Some of us will easily come to us. Right? Others of us may have to struggle to find it. But there's something about your earthly dad that you're grateful for and that can point you to the heart of the father. And that's what you're going to put on that second post-it note. Dad, I'm thankful for dad. Might be a while since we've talked to our dads. Might be a while since we've addressed him as dad. Dad, I'm thankful for. Find it. Speak it. Write it. It's a good word. It's a good word. Dad, I'm grateful for. I'm grateful. Dad, I'm grateful. Pray over that. Let that seep into your heart. Let that be part of how you see God, your Father, your Heavenly Father. Right? So take that. Now that one we're not going to crumple. That I'd like you to fold. Fold it and either put it in your wallet or your pocket. And leave with that gratefulness. Let that, yeah, put it in your Bible, put it someplace where you'll be reminded when you need to be reminded of what it is that we're grateful for in our earthly fathers and how they've given us as best they could the image of God our Father. Okay? Yeah. Great. Before I um before I move forward, is there anybody that would want to share what happened, what you thought of? You don't have to necessarily um you know share particulars, but what was that like? Did that help in any way? Did that give you some insight into something different? Yeah. One man that gave me mine, his name is Alvin Collins. That's the only father I've ever known in my life. <laughs> Talk about my uncle. Taught me a trade of building, remodeling homes. We did Kevin's house. We did our homes. And he just installed a lot in me. Took me out of Camden, brought me to Woodbury. My family, I've been grateful for all my family. Everybody I look around this room, I see family members that I'm with, the ball games with. I love all of y'all. That's all I can say. And I just thank God just to be here with y'all today. Sure. I love y'all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I miss my dad. He was a man. And I, I didn't have all his attributes. I didn't have all his skills. But he loved me. And I wish I, he was here so I could tell him face to face. I love you, Dad. I miss him. As you were sitting here talking, the spirit just hit me. Just, oh, I miss my dad. He loved me. He loved me just as I was. Just as you were. He always yeah. thought better of me. Sure. Sure. And the Lord, you know, he always encouraged me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I just want to give notice to him. Notice. Give honor to him. Okay. He loved me. Yeah. I loved him. Right. Just as you were. Just as I was. Yeah. That's perfect. That's perfect, right? That's what we get from our earthly fathers, right? That mirror, right? That's, that's, that's mirroring, mirroring the love of the Father. Right? Sure. Uh, I just 
not good with words, but I want to thank my dad for bringing me in this world. Because without him, I would have never known the Father, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. And without him, you know, to learn and everything from my mistakes in life, that I finally know what, where I'm going at. You know, I would have never known about hell. I would have never known about heaven. You know what I mean? And the, the tragedies that I went through, I would like to say every morning, mostly every morning, I get up and say the Lord's Prayer. And I always include the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because without my dad, I would have never known about anything. All right, there we go. Our earthly fathers kind of showing us a little bit about what our heavenly Father is like. Right? One last person. I imagine my uh, story is pretty the same with a lot of gentlemen in here. I had a hard time thinking of one good attribute of my father. Right, and I put down his provision because as a kid, he went to work and he provided for my family. But the one thing I, positive taking from it is that I learned what not to be as a father, right? And I was able to be an excellent father to my kid, imaging my heavenly father. Right, so all these things that you have of your earthly fathers, try to think of the the bad, and turn it to something that we can mirror of our heavenly Father, right? Yeah, Amen. That's perfect. That's it. That's perfect. It, it kind of hold on. Yep. See, I, I got a kind of a different kind of testimony in a way because I never knew a father. Never knew my natural father. I don't even have my natural father's last name. I was given the name of a guy who married my mom to give me a name. Never knew him either. But I never had a man tell me he loved me. I never had a father encourage me. But through it all, when I was old enough to understand anything, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all ways, all your thinking, everything, acknowledge God, and he will direct your paths. So I don't have anything bad or good to say about a father. I never knew one. But in the same sense, God gave me seven kids to raise, to be a father too. What did I know about being a father other than what he showed me? So that's my testimony. That's perfect. Great, great, great. great. So yeah, so it's, um, thank you. So really it's, it's um, I think with some forgiveness and some gratitude that we can reorient, turn back, to move forward in trusting the Lord and calling him Father. And so perhaps instead of looking at our earthly dad and then back to the heavenly Father, we can look to God first. If God isn't the first source of your fatherhood, as Terry just mentioned, we'll always be off balance, right? If we don't start with God, then he'll always be a replica rather than the original. So I want you to, I want to close maybe with three strategies for knowing and appreciating and deepening our relationship with the original. So the first strategy, I think, in reorienting and recalibrating how we see God is to turn to the scripture. Turn to the word to fill our minds with the true nature of God instead of turning to the shadow first. Through his gracious word, God the Father can show us that he delights to lavish his love and mercy. He just doesn't love us. He lavishes his love. That's a little bit different in my understanding. He lavishes his love. He doesn't stay angry. 
He, but he, he takes our faults and failures and he covers them with his son. He doesn't hang our shortcomings over our head, but he treats us with constant grace, putting our shortcomings as far as the east is from the west. Since his grace and mercy are new every morning, we don't have to wake up tiptoeing in his presence. Scripture tells us that our Father's patience and loving kindness never run out and that they endure forever. God the Father, through his only begotten Son, Jesus, has made a way for us to know him, his ways, his thoughts, his language, his intentions, his commitments to us as his beloved creation. In Christ Jesus, God the Father can be found. God isn't hiding God our Father didn't leave. In fact, he came looking for us to restore us from our brokenness. On a cross, he proved he came looking to restore us. On a cross, he proved he hasn't given up on us. On a cross, God our Father proved his love. And unlike any shadow of a father we might have known, he alone always keeps his promises and always makes good on his commitments. And since there is nothing that we could do to earn this fatherly love, there's nothing as his sons that we could do to lose it. No circumstance, seen or unseen, no power, no person, no action, no inaction can separate us, you and me, from God the Father's love. Ever. Can't. That's good news. <laughs> That's good news. The second strategy for deepening this relationship with God our Father is one that's necessarily uh, to build and deepen any relationship, and that's spending time. If God our Father didn't leave, Perhaps the question is, did you and I? If God, our Heavenly Father, is in hiding, are we like Adam, somewhat naked and embarrassed, hiding out from his presence as he calls us by name? Hey, Tony, where are you? Where are you? Our Father wants his sons to spend more time with him get to know him better. He wants us to be around him more, to hear his thoughts about us. I came across this. I've never read this one in, in Jeremiah, but this is his thought. It's in Jeremiah 319. He shares, this is God thinking. This is his thought. This is what he says. So picture God saying this. He uses the first person, I. Yeah, he says, I thought how gloriously and honorably I would set you among my children. And I thought I would give you a pleasant land. I thought I'd give you a good heritage. I thought I'd give you the most beautiful and best inheritance among all others. And I thought you would call me my father and you would not turn from following me. How about that for a thought? That's God thinking about you and me. So setting aside five, 10, 15 minutes, I don't know, at the start of the day, the middle of the day, the end of the day, we can turn our thoughts and our attention back toward the Father Amen. who is never not attentive to us and our needs. Time with God the Father is time to turn back to the image of who we really and essentially are, back toward the source of light that helps to reflect this true image. And this can only help polish the mirror. Time with God can have the eyes of our heart flooded with light 
so that we could know and understand the hope to which he has called us and how rich is our inheritance. Time with our Father can only sharpen that image that represents the world of the Father in this world. So meditating on the word in scripture about the Father, spending time with him in his presence, those are two strategies that will help reorient us to the original source of our sonship. And these are two strategies, I think, that can build our confidence and freedom to walk with him in good and peaceful times, but then also to run to him in turbulent and tough times. God, our Father, is always approachable. He's calling us to be confident to draw near to the throne of grace. And the third strategy, I think, to deepen our knowledge and experience of God the Father is to be active ourselves in fathering. The truest use of the word father might be to turn it from a noun about a person to a verb, an action word. To father as a verb conveys to put forth a noble effort and intention. To father someone is to equip them for a purpose. To father someone or something is to be a catalyst that sets in motion a series of God-forward results that can change the course of an individual's life, a family, a neighborhood, a church, a community. Fathering is something that all men, whether they have children or not, are designed and called to do. With the help of the Holy Spirit and modeling what we see of God the Father as practiced through his Son, we can be about a godly fathering of others. Godly fathering, like our good, good Father has shown us, is a combination of strong, holy intention mixed with hopeful, loving kindness that points to a life well lived in righteousness. Let me say that again. Godly fathering, like our good, good Father has shown us, is a combination of strong, holy intention mixed with hopeful, loving kindness that points to a life well lived in righteousness. To father is not to fill a man's genealogical spot by insemination, but for him to engage in the world with a masculine effort and inspiration that speaks life. We need to speak direction. We need to show faith. We need to father vision. We need to be about delight. Wherever God, as, a, as our father, is this inspiration, that's where a man, that's where men do it. Then we can hope, and hope grows. With fathering, vision stirs. With fathering, life springs. With fathering, the kingdom comes. With fathering, his will gets done, one person at a time. Amen. So how are you doing with fathering? Can you take a more active role in fathering someone somewhere? And where would that be? And who would be the recipient of your fathering? If you're doing it, continue doing it with the Father's help and inspiration. If you're not, find somebody and start. So gentlemen, let's push into the word to learn more of the goodness of God our Father. Spend some quality, undistracted, phone put away time, 
father-son time with him and be active in a fuller way in godly fathering in your immediate or extended family. As men, let's man the helm and turn the ship around. Let the fatherhood of God be the beacon that draws us safely into the harbor. Let's go home. Our father's waiting there. And trust me, it's safe. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So as we, uh, we're ready for maybe like a 10-minute break, but before we do, um, I think we had talked earlier, we, we want to kind of end each of these uh, sessions with a time of reflection, right? So um, just briefly, right, um, any reflections? As uh, Tony was saying, carving out time to spend with God, whatever part of the day, it's, I found it's better if you do it at the beginning of your day before the world gets in the way, you know, because we're called to give him the first fruits by the time your day is done. You're done, you know, you're worn out and you're giving God the crumbs by then, you know, so. Great, great. One other insight, one or two other insights or reflections, right? Well, every morning I get up, I say the Lord's Prayer, you know, in the Bible, and I thank God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for everything. And one thing I'd like to say, when time comes in, I want to see Jesus. That's all there is to it. I want to see God and Jesus in the Trinity. That's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Just want to see Jesus. That's great. All right, great. All right, great. So let's take, um, let's take 10 minutes, and uh, by 1130, we'll come back in our seats, grab um, uh, something to drink. Uh, waters are in the chest. The restrooms are in the back. And we'll convene for the second session um, in 10 minutes. No coffee yet. It's cooking. Okay. <laughs>